Hi, my name is Blake, and I have just a quick note before we get started. Actually, it's more like a recommendation, because this podcast is an immersive audio experience, part fact, part fantasy. It's best that you listen with headphones on, imagination on, and everything else turned off. Welcome to Abandoned, the All-American Ruins podcast. Season 2, Episode 6. Jake. Cleveland has the lake. Erie, that is. And that's one of the main reasons it has the big industry it has. And industry is what makes Cleveland move. Sometimes, it's hard to tell if there's a way in. Take the Huff Bakery in Cleveland, Ohio, for example. When Jake and I roll up to the front of the building, or at least the front as Google Maps has determined it, we can't figure out where the entrance is. But after a bit of poking about, we find it nestled between two white walls towards the center of the complex. Clamoring out of the car, I suddenly notice Jake's posture. It's astute, as astute as his speech pattern, the tone of his voice, his version of diction, the shape of his Midwestern vowels, flat A's that sing. Slow, measured, tempered. Like Jake. He takes his time, in everything. It can be irritating, (laughs) like how often he goes back to make sure he locked the car, or how long it takes to choose a beer off the menu. The care and consideration that goes into sorting receipts on his dusty keyboard in his not-up-to-code studio apartment, under high ceilings, the afternoon light monitoring the aloe plant in his front window. We slip through a large incision in a brick and cement wall, and by the nature of my Sagittarius moon, I take the lead. We're standing in a drippy front hallway, a short corridor that must have served as a welcome center for visitors. Normally, I'd hear the chatter of those phantoms echoing all around me, but my imagination is blank today. The southwest side of the passageway faces the outside courtyard, littered in garbage, remnants of the formerly thriving bakery. I can't stop staring at the back of Jake's head, and at his stately, prominent neck. All I can do is adore that full head of hair on Jake's sturdy, upright, six-foot build. He's lean, almost a swimmer's frame, and like so many queer people I know, he has body issues that confuse me because I am so deeply attracted to every pore on him. On weekends at my house, I like to poke my head outside every so often, spring into late fall, to secretly watch Jake dig his hands into the dirt. When he mows the lawn with his dork-ass headphones on and his golfer dad's sunglasses clutching the sides of his dusty red brunette head, I can't help but objectify him, drooling over his sweat-soaked skin. He's hot, objectively. And he's from here. Ohio, not Cleveland, but he's an Ohioan through and through. He wasn't aware of the Huff Bakery, though, not until I brought it to his attention. Years ago, Huff was the largest multiple-unit bakery in Ohio, extending from its flagship location at 1519 Lakeview Road in Cleveland to branches in Lake, Portage, and Summit Counties, and many, many more. For years, Huff experienced massive success— However, soaring costs of production, the fear of modernization, plus the growing competition from larger corporations sparked a sudden closure of all facilities, including the Star Bakery plant on Lakeview. After filing for Chapter 7 bankruptcy, any and all remaining subsidiary divisions and company assets were sold to various larger entities, including the Huff Recipe Book, which was acquired by Kraft Foods. I usually don't know little factoids like this. But Jake does. He's a current events kind of guy. In fact, I don't need to watch the news anymore, or check the weather, or even doom scroll, because 
Jake's got it, and he enjoys it. He knows how to process it, calmly digest sensationalized headlines. He doesn't feel any less rage about the state of things than I do, but he stays grounded and allows his innate wisdom to guide conversations with unlike-minded individuals. I think the word is fascists. The mid-morning May sun bleeds through the tiny glass windows that face the outside, into the must of the complex. I run my finger along the smooth textures, past two fake trees and giant wicker baskets covered in condensation from last night's early spring rain. Jake and I step into an enormous cavern, which I instantly identify as the first line of production. This large room, in the round, boasts the kind of machinery you'd imagine sitting rotting inside any abandoned industrial bakery from the 1950s or 60s. Comically large ovens, scissoring with conveyor belts, buttons, lights, gears, rockets, steel, ancient power sources, the smell of oil and wheat, the phantasmic hiss of motor engines spitting and sputtering while the voices of first and second generation Ohioans float through the gluten-stained air. Ohioans like Jake's grandparents. There's nothing to do now but wait for nature to perform its miracle of fermentation in its own good time. Two hours it takes to rise up and fill the pan. I wish they could have seen how happy he makes me. Imagine that. Healthy, transparent boundaries. A concept I didn't even understand until my 30s. Somehow, I thought I'd at least hear both his grandfather and grandmother hanging out here. Not that Jake's grandparents worked at Huff, they didn't, but it's their generation, and surely they knew what Huff bakeries were. Reactivating it so that the yeast can make the bread even livelier until it is ready to be scaled. I honestly thought I'd be surrounded by a lot of specters now. This life-saving practice of playing pretend has a tendency to kick in quick when I enter these abandoned sanctuaries, but today is different. Jake and I are on our way back to the Hudson Valley, having spent the weekend at an unfortunate family reunion, a memorial walk for the father of Jake's brother-in-law. They recently lost him to pancreatic cancer. Oh, and by the way, it was the first time I was meeting his entire family. So, okay, my imagination doesn't turn on today. Is that so bad? This visit isn't necessarily for my own mental, emotional, spiritual health anyway, which is why I usually stake out abandoned spaces. But today, I don't know exactly what my intention in bringing Jake to the ruins of Huff Bakery is, other than an invitation for him to take a peek inside this small piece of my life he knows about only peripherally. I picture that it's the way Jake feels when he has his hands in the dirt, helping shit grow. He honors the rule bender in me by obliging my adventurous muse and accompanying me on this strange date. He says he thinks my wanderlust is sexy. He likes that I'm an artist. He thinks it makes me smart. Confident. I never think about myself that way. Confident. Maybe I am. Here we are, two autonomous amoebas drifting through this abandoned ether, each of us spinning on our own gravitational axis, sometimes entering each other's orbit, sometimes not. I love being independent, and Jake loves that I love being independent, and vice versa. I peel off from him and come across a section of the plant that contains several old department store display cases. Winkleman's. I've never even heard of it. This is a big department store. What do they sell here? Let's look in the windows and find out. The department store sells clothes. You can buy them in the clothing department. Which department can you buy shoes in? The shoe department, of course. Shoe racks and jewelry display cases, Decades of undoing in the shadow of a tall filing cabinet where I spot the red Teletubby, Poe, standing up inside one of the drawers. 
I catch Jake scoping out a long hallway that at one time served as a delivery dock. I sneak closer and watch him from afar, the same way that I watch him from my carport when he's out gardening. He picks through every object in the room, paint cans and marketing materials, empty receipt rolls and product labels, canned food and tools and large gray metal vats filled with nothing. He peers way up at the ceiling, undoubtedly asking himself hundreds of questions about the architecture, its stability, the hows and the whys of the weather's effects on said stability, demanding information on what each and every machine in the factory was responsible for when it was still alive. We reconvene and enter a confusing room that looks like it's been used to be a kitschy tourist bar. There's a jukebox, an old ticket counter, a bar, mirrors, broken glass booths. I'm dumbfounded. I don't understand, and neither does Jake. He's particularly attracted to a crumbling roof in the next room, hovering over another battered bar. And enchanted by the glow, he leaves, but I stay. And that's when the atmosphere starts to shift, a slow crossfade from the sight of Jake walking away into the early 2000s, post 9-11 shock, the dawn of the cell phone as a primary method of communication for the general public, a showcase of millions of millennials around the world sitting on the fence between a world before and after You've Got Mail came out. It's actually one of my favorite movies. I bought a copy of it years later when I saw it in the $5 DVD bin at Walmart. Britney Spears' Oops, I Did It Again purrs its perfect pop on the jukebox. I smell popcorn and hear skee-ball machines and gawk at Miss Pac-Man arcade towers. There's a vending machine, Pepsi products, canned soda for 50 cents a can. I'm in middle school, or at least in my imagination. I'm afraid to look at myself in a mirror on the wall. I wasn't prepared to confront my 8th grade self. A mop of hair on my head, a literal bike helmet made out of dark, shaggy, full-volumed strands that would fool any passing stranger into thinking that this scared, secretive young man would one day be taking one milligram of finasteride a day to prevent himself from balding, the medication delivered from a company called Roman right to his doorstep. I make my way through the crowd of middle and high schoolers looking for Jake, and exit today's brief fling with my imagination, the echoes of Vanessa Carlton's A Thousand Miles slowly fading out with mighty reverb, lilting down the halls of the Huff Bakery and up into the Cleveland sky. I find Jake standing underneath the cracks in the ceiling, allowing the light to seep into his skin. He asks me if I'll take a picture. Of course I will. I like taking pictures of him, spotlighting his handsome face, his solid set of shoulders that carry a lot of unspoken emotional and mental weight, the back of his prominent neck. Click. Click. The photos are just for us. He looks good. We press onward into a room with a disco ball sprawled out on a pool table. By now, nothing surprises me. This aging architectural testament to the downfall of Midwestern commerce is packed to the brim with spirits of many, many strange things. One of the many capitalistic dominoes that fell to create the vast rust belt. Somehow, over the course of trying to save itself from bankruptcy, Huff must have rented out sections of the compound to other small businesses. It's the only explanation I can muster up, and after hours and days of extensive research, I still can't find an answer. There was clearly a restaurant here. Clearly a dance hall. A storage unit for Winkleman's. It's confusing. The most confusing visit to an American ruin yet. There are records scattered everywhere. I pick one up. It's a 7-inch BB King single. I look at the clock and realize we've overstayed our welcome. It's time to go. I don't want to, but it's hundreds of miles back to New York. We exit the building to a loading dock and discover an abandoned street food cart, intimate and alone, as the soft breeze of Cleveland pulls us out to a back road, Auburndale Avenue, 
where we walk by houses that, while still very much lived in, look as though they might be abandoned any day now. The neighborhood is actually filled with empty, boarded homes, roofs caving in, porches disintegrating. We walk under a cement railroad trestle, still active, that runs along the southwestern side of the bakery, which itself takes up a large chunk of the Glenville neighborhood in Cleveland, 3.7 acres, nearly 180,000 square feet, an emblem of the Rust Belt, a time capsule that bears witness to Midwestern resiliency and loyalty, to American culture, and the systems that weave it all together. I don't know what I'm supposed to think about this neighborhood. I know I feel sad, but I can't explain why. Sometimes that happens. It could be my four planets in Scorpio. It could be my genetics. It could just be the sad fact that there are many, many interpretations of the great American dream, and the cynic in me doesn't think it's possible to align them all. I look at Jake as we walk through the empty streets of Cleveland on this dreary spring morning and think about his interpretation. I know it includes a hefty, unimaginable amount of change. It's the kind of change I want to see. But suddenly, he turns a corner, and all these thoughts disappear as I'm faced once again with the back of his stately, prominent neck. <laughs> God damn. I am totally in love with that stately, prominent neck. If you're just tuning in, welcome to the second season of Abandoned, the All-American Ruins podcast. Join me every other week as I take you on an immersive sonic journey, recounting my expeditions of abandoned spaces across the United States, which I transform into fantastical audio experiences that allow you, dear listener, to dive into my imagination with me, or maybe inspire you to go out and use your own. Next time, a one-night stand followed by a trip to an abandoned water park on the shores of the Outer Banks in North Carolina. If you don't want to miss it, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please subscribe, rate, and review. I would appreciate it so much. Thank you. Also, if you like to read or enjoy amateur photography, just know that each episode this season is adapted from the original All American Ruins blog, where you can catch up on more of my adventures. Just visit allamericanruins.com or you can follow me on Instagram at allamericanruins. Abandoned, the All American Ruins podcast is hosted, written, edited, and produced by me, Blake File, with studio space courtesy of Radio Kingston, WKNY, AM 1490, FM 1079 in Kingston, New York. Special thanks to Ida Hakala, Jimmy Buff, and Manuel Bloss for the mentorship and encouragement, to you, the listener, for taking time to explore these abandoned spaces with me, and Jake handsome, sweet Jacob. I love you, sweet pea.